Adams is here to give us a uh, uh, primer uh, on the uh, open meeting law. Uh, this is something that we had to commit to um, a year ago, and uh, I'm so glad that we get to come down here and uh, give us a discussion on the open meeting law. Um, you'll take questions afterwards. It's a short presentation. I'm sure I'm, I hope there will be lots of questions. Um, he'll be here to answer whatever questions he gets, I hope. Um, and uh, there's, there's uh, uh, cider in the back, help yourself with donuts, cookies. Sorry, we didn't put there, but. Uh, cider. Is that cider? No, cider. <laughs> Depends on what he's saying. If you get this back on October 1st, I'll start starting. It's half a pound of cider, thank you, Nancy. And uh, it's, uh, it's good stuff, so I help yourself. Okay. And there's also a signing sheet. We're not, we, I, I would just like to see the, the show has got a signing sheet. If you haven't signed in, some for individual towns, some for regional areas, we do some for uh, county boards or whatever, but we try to make sure, make it simple. Um, it's a small group, it's a short presentation. What we can do is I'll, I'll take questions. Uh, by the way, Chris Winters is my deputy secretary, he's over here. Uh, he's my lawyer. <laughs> But we've, you know, we've worked hard at, at trying to improve transparency in government over many different areas. What you're going to see is just strictly the open meeting law. We, on our transparency tour, we also do the Public Records Act, how to get public records, uh, and what qualifies as a public record. So, what I'll, what I'll do is just, if you have a question, stop me and I'll, I'll answer it or try to. Uh, I try not to get into specific issues, but kind of try to keep it general. Um, we're, we're not considered a legal source for answers, but we do try to offer what the law says and, and explain how the law is written. So we'll just go from there and get started. So why are we here? We're here because democracy, accountability, and openness key point to remember, the public has a right to know. Open meeting and public records laws protect us, protect our direct access to the decisions that affect us, and understanding these laws makes us all a better citizen. In government, the ultimate boss is the public. That's written right out in the Constitution, Chapter 1, Article 6, and it says that all power being originally inherent in and consequently derived from the people Therefore, all officers of government, whether legislative or executive, specifically leaves out judiciary, are their trustees and servants, and at all times in a legal way are accountable to them. And then you have 1 PSA 311 is the Declaration of Public Policy for the Open Meeting Law. 1 PSA 315 is the policy for public records. What we're going to focus on is this one today, and it's about public commissions, boards, councils, and other public agencies in the state exist to aid in the conduct of the people's business and are accountable to them. So, the statutes are easy to find. They're very short, 310 through 314 in Title I. Uh, we'll keep going here. Who must apply? So the first question that you have to ask when you're talking about a public open meeting is, is it a public body of the state or its municipality? As the, the statute says, the state municipal boards, councils, and commissions, and any committees and subcommittees of these bodies, not included are individual officials, councils established by the governor exclusively for policy advice, the judicial branch, the public service board, which is considered uh, a judicial type of system, and nonprofits generally. 
And I say generally on nonprofits because it really comes down to what's in their bylaws. Uh, for instance, uh, a few years ago, there was a little to do with uh, uh, Vermont Public Television. And because some of their money flows from the, uh, what is it, the Center for Public TV or whatever, um, their bylaws had said that they had to comply with open meeting laws within their state. So they do have to follow it now. So it's not necessarily all nonprofits, but most. So when does the open meeting law apply? Any kind of quorum of the board needs to hold a meeting. What's the quorum? The quorum is the majority of the entire public body. As I understand it, Bruce, you're a three member select board, so that means two members are a quorum. So anytime two members of the select board are together, they're considered a quorum. There is something called 1 BSA 172, which is joint authority. When joint authority is given to three or more, the concurrence of the majority of such shall be sufficient and shall be required in its exercise. Essentially what that's saying is you've got to have two votes to pass something. So you couldn't have, first of all, you can't have a meeting of two, one person uh, and then have them vote to pass it. And they, they still need two votes. And the same goes with three members, you need two to pass. Does the Justice of the Peace have to have to be present during the meeting? The select board meetings? No. No, a JP during, oh, only the select board, but not a, okay. Anytime you have a board or a commission, it's the, it's, it still has to be a quorum. To, to transact any business, you have to have a quorum of, of that board. Okay. So if you have a five-member board, it's three. If you have a three-member board, it's two. Seven-member board, it would be four. But I always thought, even though whatever that number is, a justice of the peace has to be present to witness. No, not to. Okay. No, and then a meeting, a gathering of the quorum of a public body for the purpose of discussing business or taking action. So it's the business of the board. So if, if and this, this, to put it bluntly, if actually you could have all three members of the select board meeting at a coffee house, they just happen to show up there. As long as they're talking about the Red Sox or the Patriots or whatever, they're fine. But if they start talking about the budget, they're in trouble. Unless they warn them. Uh, so it's the business of the public body. The public body's government functions, including any matter over which the public body has supervision, control, jurisdiction, or advisory power. So it's pretty simple. A quorum can meet as long as they're not talking business. But if they want to talk about anything else, their vacations or whatever, they're, they're fine. It, there's not a problem with that. So a meeting can occur regardless of the physical location. There's no exception for work sessions or retreats. We often hear people say, well, we had a work session. Therefore, we didn't have a, a formal meeting. There's no such thing in the statutes as a work session or a retreat. They are considered meetings if you have a quorum and you're discussing the business of the town. Uh, when I was, uh, just to give you a quick background, I had 18 years on the South Burlington City Council, eight years in the State Senate, and then uh, now almost 10 years as Secretary of State. When I was on the City Council in South Burlington, we used to annually have a, what we called a retreat, but we treated it as a public meeting. So we would warn it, we would post it, we would allow the public to come to that meeting even though we were talking about strategies for the next year or whatever, that we were you know, looking at what, what did we want to accomplish, we would always, uh, publicize that meeting. And typically we wouldn't get very many. Um, Tim, yes. Do you have to allow the public participation in that meeting? Yeah, I, I mean, I think the statute is clear because it was changed a couple of years ago where you have to provide an op, an op, uh, it, it, you have to allow the public to participate in the meeting. That's one of the tenets of the open meeting law. Not only do they have a right to know, they have a right to participate. But that can be at the beginning of the meeting, or the end of the meeting, but not yeah. the deliberate. Different towns do it differently. Yeah. Um, the city of Burlington does it all up front. I would argue that I'm not sure how the public 
would know what they want to say up front if they haven't heard what's going to happen. But uh, like in South Burlington, we would have we would have the first item on our agenda would be uh, any public discussion on any item that's not on the agenda for that night. And then during the agenda, as we worked our way through it, if people would raise their hands, we would allow them to speak. Uh, I will tell you that when we had our uh, public meetings to discuss our budget, we had a $10 million operating budget at the time. And we'd have maybe two people show up from the public, and they wouldn't say a word, they'd just sit there and watch us. Then maybe three weeks later, we'd have a public meeting to discuss the leash law uh, in South Burlington. And we'd have, it wasn't gonna cost a dime, 150 people would show up, 75 would be for it, 75 against it, and they all wanted to say something. So, uh, so we, you also have to be careful, this is the newest thing, and this is mainly because of social media and emails. But a meeting can come together over a span of time. So you have to watch out for email strings and social media discussions. Now there was just, was it today there was a story about where Williamstown uh, said to their select board, stay off of Facebook. <laughs> Even on the town website. Uh, because you can't get yourself into trouble. What about uh, then Facebook or that the town has an account or doesn't thinking of having an account to celebrate community events? And then a second question, I won't raise my hand again, is uh, meetings after the meeting adjourns where there's Great a little question. social so, thing going on and what about this and what about So first let me say that there's nothing wrong with the town having a Facebook page to broadcast meetings, to broadcast um, events that are going on, the farmer's market, whatever. Nothing wrong with that. But if all of a sudden it devolves, if someone asks a question, hey, Bruce Hyde, what about this issue? And then all of a sudden the rest of the select board starts <coughs> chiming in, you've now got a de facto meeting going on. So you have to be careful about that kind of situation. The other situation, we actually had an example of that up in the Northeast Kingdom. I get this phone call from a reporter asking me, uh, is it okay for the select board to adjourn their meeting and then start discussing the budget with the treasurer? And I said, well, were they, was it a warm meeting? Yeah, but they'd already adjourned. I said, no, of course not. Now, <laughs> uh, I wasn't ready for the next day when the, across the top of the paper of the Caledonia record, it said, Secretary of State says illegal meeting. Uh, <laughs> um, so I had to answer a lot of questions and one of them was from the select board chair who called me up and said, you don't understand. And I said, what didn't I understand? And he goes, we had already adjourned. I said, let me ask you a couple quick questions. You had adjourned? Yes. Were you discussing town business? Yes. Did you have a quorum? Yes. Then you were in an illegal meeting doing that. And he again said, I didn't understand. <laughs> so it really comes down to um, just being aware of your situation. Uh, it's not uncommon for a select board, you know, they might be having their meeting, they adjourn the meeting. And if they want to convince about a few things, go ahead. But if they start talking about town business after they've adjourned, that's a no-no. Just another quick question I wondered about. Uh, during a select board meeting, I know this might be obvious, but one of the concerns I have is, are select board members, do they have any right to be texted? It sounds crazy, and who would do it? But it's a concern of mine where, up wherever they sit, they could be texting information to themselves and the, the, the group or the, uh, you know, the, the public isn't seeing what's really happening. It's a weird thing, but it's something I'm kind of concerned about. Um, 
I, uh, I would caution that select board to be very, very careful about that. Right. Well, I'm just saying. Uh, if you're, first of all, your texts are considered public records if they're talking about town business. Okay. So someone could demand to see what your texts were. And that's part of the right to know that the public has to, and to participate. And if you've got select board members texting back and forth, Right. Well, I don't think we should pass this or whatever. Yeah. Um, well, it might be naivete too. Oh, I didn't know I couldn't do that. Well, it's just like the guy in Burlington that said, "Oh, I'm sorry, I just didn't understand." Well, the next day, the next week, you would have answered ten thousand questions. He did. His ignorance didn't work. It's, it's really. It, first of all, the, the folks that are on the select board should know the laws. They should review these laws. They should review what the open meeting law is about so that you, you understand them. Um, but you also need to understand what public records are. And unless it, any, any record created by a governmental body is considered a public record, unless it has an exemption that prevents disclosure. So every record that state government creates is considered public unless there's an exemption, and there's a lot of exemptions. There's about 260 in the statutes uh, that allow certain information, medical information, personal ID information, those kinds of things. But there's also a lot of other. I mean, I had uh, Chris and I were dealing with a, uh, the VPR reporter about uh, cybersecurity on our election system, and he insisted that I give him the report from a test that we had done on our system. And I told him I wasn't going to give it to him. That I did. I was. Uh, I had an exemption that I could use. And I said, really, all you need to know is that we received a report and we've acted on it. And he said, but the public has a right to know. And I said, well, but the public also has a right not to have all the information in this particular instance. And I said, if I do give it to you, and the first thing I, I said to him was, if I do give it to you. I might as well put it in an envelope and write on it Vladimir Putin the Kremlin and send it because you know the, the Russians are gonna get it. Jim, if I could just add on, on text messaging, the fact that you're asking this question is why we recommend against it happening in meetings. And I've been guilty of this myself as a member of a school board. I might be texting my wife about am I gonna make it back in time for the soccer game, but no one out in the audience knows that. And it's kind of like they don't they don't know who I'm texting, what I'm doing. It'd be like passing notes during a meeting, and the public is not privy to whatever conversation is happening up there. And it's supposed to be out in the open with everybody able to hear what's what the conversation is. So even if it's innocent, it doesn't look that way um, to someone sitting in the public like like you're describing. Well, this brought up a question I called. I talked to the uh, your, one of your people, Jenny. She's your Jenny. general counsel. Yeah. I had this big question yesterday, and I don't mean to take too much time, but I asked her if select board members, including the town clerk, take the oath of office. In other words, they certify, whether before the American flag, that they are going to apply and sit, hold still, hold true the Vermont Constitution, and probably the U.S. Constitution. Both. And we, yeah, but I don't think many people Things that I'm seeing realized are wonderful. And that's, uh, we won't get into detail in the town, but uh, I think some of the people might want to remember that they signed a certificate, whether they held their hand or not, that they are committed to the foundation right. of the Constitution. It's, like, it's, always, it's always an issue. Uh, <clears throat> if people are running for office, in that town meeting day, and do we have a right as a, a voters to ask them to commit to take open meeting law training? You can ask them. They can uh, tell you uh, yes, and they no, don't have no, to. In the, in the case that the, that the four of us had, the judge said she could not order the select board to take the training, but if they agreed to in writing, which was part of our settlement agreement, then to, we could uh, up, to, up to, they would uphold the settlement agreement. That's similar to what we're saying is 
uh, will you agree to take the uh, tra training? Yeah. Okay. So I don't know about that particular instance, but I can tell you that Bruce had contacted me. We're, we saw each other somewhere. In, in the spring. It was in the spring, and, and he had said to me, can we get you out to Granville to have a uh, presentation on the open meeting law? And I said, sure, just let, let us know when. So. But that's all voluntary. Well, yeah. you know, so, I, I tried to get all of our commissions and boards to attend to but we cannot, you require, can't force them. we cannot require our planning commission, our conservation commission, our sanitary commission to come to this. I'm not saying that. I'm uh, saying when a person is running for select board, can we ask them to commit that they will take the training? Sure you can. All right. And then hold them to it. And then that's up to you to hold them to it. Yeah. <laughs> so. Well, Bruce has told us to take it to court. No, go to court. That's what we and that's why we, the four of us, did. Oh, question on uh, physical lo location. Say three select board members go to a work site for a culvert replacement. Does that have to be noticed? For a what? Say a culvert no, or, no. or a bridge or work with a contract. So uh, you're kind of crossing it, and we're going to kind of get into the different types of meetings, but. Uh, whether it's a regular meeting, a special meeting, or an emergency meeting. Um, but let, let me just say that if a select board is going to meet, if a, full, if a quorum of the select board is going to meet, I don't care if it's here or at a school or uh, at someone's house uh, or at a, on a street corner, if the three of them are, me are meeting and they're talking about business of the town, then they probably should be, not probably, they must, uh, you know, call an agenda and call it a special meeting. Now, the, and we'll get into it a little bit, but the one caveat to that is, let's say there was a huge rainstorm that wiped out the culvert and the roads, uh, you know, what, uh, open, um, you can have an emergency meeting where you, have to still notify the public that you're having the meeting, but you can meet on a very short notice. So we'll get into more about the, the meeting structure itself. Yes, ma'am. I'm a cemetery commissioner, and during the summertime, we hold our meetings at the cemetery. It's a working meeting. And um, I may, we have our regular meetings at the town hall, but I generally put up a notice that we're at the cemetery. That's fine. So I forget to put the notice up, but nobody comes in with us. I don't not, worry too much. But you, you can't sure rely on that part of it, but, but I think as long as you're making an effort to notify people, that's the important thing. The Any kind of change, and we'll talk more about the setting agendas and, and whatever. Uh, so a meeting does not include communications to schedule a meeting, organize an agenda, or distribute materials that will be discussed at the meeting. Or it doesn't include clerical work or staff work assignments, routine day-to-day -day administrative matters, no action is required and no money is appropriated, site inspections to assess damage to make tax assessments or abatements, quasi-judicial deliberations. Quasi-judicial, this would probably be more in your zoning board or, or planning commission, depending on how you set up. A meeting also does not include occasions when a quorum of a public body attends a social gathering, a convention, a conference, a training program, press conferences, media events, or other wise gathered or otherwise gets together, provided that the public body is not discussing the specific business of that body at the time of the exchange. The, the, and the participating members expect to be the business of the public body at a different meeting that's scheduled. A gathering of a quorum of a public body at a duly warned public meeting of another public body, provided that the attending public body does not take action on its business. So if you had, let's say, the select board calls in the planning commission to discuss stuff with them, as long as it's being noticed and that the planning commission is not taking action, they don't have to notice that they're coming to the meeting because it's going to be on your agenda. Now that was our question last <laughs> Exact question. Okay. Um, we're presenting zoning changes, and they're going to go to the select board Monday night. And we were wondering 
if we needed to be a quorum there. You can have a quorum there as long as the select board has put on their agenda that the zoning board is coming in to present their changes to us and you're not taking action on the zoning board, on the zoning changes that night. It's the select board's meeting. Okay. But Jim, if you're going to a ribbon cutting and you're going to accept a check uh, from uh, somebody, is that a meeting where if two of us showed up, that should be warned? Yes, it would be not included. As long as you're not taking We're action. We're not doing any business. So here's the advanced public notice part of this law. There are three types of meetings, regular meetings, special meetings, and emergency. Regular meetings, that's what happens at the beginning of when the select board is sworn in after their election. Uh, they adopt a resolution or a motion that they're gonna meet at 7 p.m. at Town Hall on first Monday of every month. Um, so they need to post and make an agenda available 48 hours before each meeting. A special meeting where you only have to give 24 hours notice is if any one of those pieces of that meeting from your regular agenda changes. So if you're meeting not on the first Monday, but on the second Monday, or you're meeting at, instead of seven o'clock, you're meeting at 7.30, or you're meeting not at the town hall, but at the, uh, at the barn down the street or something, for whatever reason, then you would call a special meeting, and it has to be warned 24 hours ahead of time. You have to notify any newspaper or radio station that serves your area, and any person who specifically asks in writing uh, to be notified of special meetings, usually that's the press, uh, and, and all members of the public body. And it, you wonder why is that? Because there have been cases where a select board, uh, let's say a five member select board, they have three people who are for something and two that are not, and they call a special meeting and they don't tell the two that are not uh, in favor so that they can have the man. So you have to notify all members of the public body. And they also have to post and make an agenda available 24 hours ahead of time. Emergency meetings, and this one gets confused sometimes, only use when necessary to respond to unforeseen occurrences or conditions requiring immediate attention. You must give some public notice as soon as you can before the meeting. So, 2011, September, you remember this well. 2011, there were hundreds of emergency meetings going on throughout the state of Vermont after Hurricane Irene hit us. Uh, those were emergency meetings. They were meeting at this culvert, at that bridge, at this washout whatever it was, select boards were meeting all over the state trying to get a handle on what was going on. We've had occasions where um, my old town before, I, since I left, um, they called an emergency meeting because they forgot to sign a contract on their Monday night meeting. So they called an emergency meeting for Friday morning. Uh, I called up the town manager and I said, well, that would actually be a special meeting, and you, you certainly could have met the 24-hour notice and said they were calling in without telling anybody on, on an emergency basis. The other thing that I, I always try to explain to people is the first item on our agenda has always been, are there any changes to the agenda? Second item is, does the public have any comment on anything not on the agenda? So the first item, Sometimes our town manager would say to us, I gotta add two items to the agenda tonight that need to be discussed. So we would say, okay, he would hand out some documents and we would say, we'll add it to the agenda after item number three, um, but we will not take action on it until we warn it on a meeting that we're gonna take action. So that the public has a right, because the public has a right to know to attend and to participate. And it's very simple. The public has a right to know, to attend, and participate. And you should not take an action on something that has not been warned for action uh, at your select board meeting. 
uh, without the public knowing about it. Question. Yes. When you're warning uh, in these uh, special or emergency meetings, does the warning have to say uh, pick up select board special meeting or is it just a regular meeting out of sequence? Uh, no, I would, I would call it a special meeting. The uh, Granville uh, Select Board is meeting to discuss whatever and set your agenda. Yes, sir. Let me give you a hypothetical. Uh, that's some public notice. That's it. Suppose it's the middle of the night. Suppose taking action is a matter of public safety. People could be hurt or worse. <coughs> you wait till the next morning and put it on the bulletin boards, and maybe somebody doesn't make it because you did that. What do you do in the middle of the night if, if it's an emergency and there's no communications, there's no radio stations on the air? Right. How do you handle it? So again, emergency meetings are only used when necessary to respond to unforeseen occurrences requiring immediate attention. You must give the public notice as soon as possible. Public notice could end up being after, but at least you notify the public. I mean, if, if something, let's say the town hall is on fire okay. in the middle of the night. Exactly. Um, what threw me is you said before the meeting. Well, yeah. it's, if you can do it before the meeting, that's the best, but you have to notify sure. the public that you should take an action. And I mean, that is quite vague, and I understand that it needs to be. But um, I'm wondering, if, Bruce, I don't even know, maybe you have an answer. Like in 2011, were there minutes when everyone, like when people were standing around the culverts and nobody had to consider the internet? Yeah. The law changed since then. Oh, this is. <laughs> no, there are minutes. There are um, napkins. <laughs> and, and that's very possible. It's very possible. They could, I mean, I, I would not be surprised if there were select board members meeting at someone's kitchen table. Sure. And taking just a, a napkin and, and writing down, this is what we're going to do, yeah, yeah. Uh, and getting it written down. But anyway, um, the requirements for the special meetings, uh, we seem to be doing that for our regular meetings, our, uh, giving the three day notice and to all the people that specifically the whole email list that we have and posting it in three places around town and uh, our website. Um, that seems to be what you have written down for special meetings, but you don't have any of that written for regular meetings. Is, what, what are the requirements for regular meetings? Regular meetings, you have to post it to make the agenda available at least 48 hours ahead of time. Do you not have to do it in three places or two? Uh, it actually, it does have to. We, that's, I, I apologize, we took that for granted. Uh, <laughs> uh, and, but this is also making it clear that you have to do it um, for special meetings as well. And special meetings, again, if anything, if you meet first Monday, 7 p.m., town hall, those three factors, if any one of those three changes for whatever reason, then you have to call it as a special meeting and warn it. But you have, a special meeting allows you to only have 24 hours notice on your agendas when you post them. I thought they were overachievers. <laughs> I'm concerned about the minutes, uh, even during our meeting. We're going to get the minutes. We haven't gotten there yet. Okay. I'm just thinking about napkins being placed, but I'm just thinking they should have all been compiled and put into the proper minutes per... Okay. There's actually nothing that says that, but, but we'll get into that a little bit. Okay. Uh, agendas. Yes. Uh, municipal uh, locations in the town. Say it, it's not done. Is that any legal meeting? I... I haven't heard of anybody actually raising that point, um, but in, in the interest of right to know, I would suggest that the town should be posting it. I don't think there's, you, know, you could bring it up to a judge, and, and if a judge said, yeah, they should have notified, and they, they could, there's a, there's a point in this presentation where it says that a judge could void it, a meeting if they thought, or the actions of that meeting, if they thought that the town didn't follow the process. But it's, it's hard for me to say. I mean, I, I don't know the particulars in this particular, in what you're describing, but I would say that you have to, you're required by law to follow. Jim, I think it's important to reiterate again, that this doesn't just apply to select boards. It applies to all boards. Planning commissions, conservation, Library yeah. Commission, Mission, cemetery, Everything. school boards. So 
um, post and make an agenda available 48 hours before each meeting. Uh, by statute, what are the locations for that posting of an agenda? Well, the town clerk's office. And then designated. And then designated wherever the other two locations are. And then website. And website, if you have, if you have, if the town maintain, how maintains or has a designated website, we're supposed to post them on there. Okay. Uh, I just wanted to follow up on this gentleman's question. <coughs> Say you've forgotten to post. It was a serious mistake, or as in your early example, an email thread that was about planning turned into a discussion. Like you've made a mistake. Is there a way to remedy it? Should you report yes, it? Yes, board can just... come back and remedy. Okay. They can remedy at, at, a, at a publicly warned meeting that says they're going to take up the issue of, of a situation where they didn't follow the law. Uh, we haven't got that detail in here, but uh, it, it's in the law. So as far as agendas, again, when? At least 48 hours for a regular meeting, 24 hours for a special meeting, where? On a website, here's where, here we go, I did have it in here, I thought I did. Where? On a website that the public body maintains or designates if they have one. Municipal well, public bodies only, so not all, Bruce, I want to make sure you understand, it's only municipal public bodies that have to post their agendas in or near the town clerk's office and two other designated places and anybody that has made a specific request so if people have called up uh, the town clerk Kathy and said please notify me of any special meetings then she would have an obligation to uh, send an agenda to those people that have asked to be notified uh, what else you should address specific topics to be discussed and potential actions any addition or deletion must be the first act of business at the meeting. So this is, goes back to what I said we used to do for years, which is, are there any changes to the agenda? Uh, and any other adjustment after that can be made during the meeting. But again, I would just caution anybody, any select board, not to take an action on something that wasn't warned for action. Yes. Um, about the request for the agenda from the town clerk, does that request have to be made annually or is it just yes. one time that's it? This one is annually um, and then you have to read, you have to re you have to re ask in the next year. They have to ask again. Right, it's, and, and actually the law is in fact they didn't change that part of it. No. So the law says <laughs> If you, if someone puts, if John Smith says to you, I want to be notified of any special agenda, any special meetings um, from January to November, then it's for whatever time he, he notifies you for the rest of that calendar year. No, for calendar year. For calendar year. But if they notify you in December, then it's good for the next year. They could ask a blanket I want all the agendas all the public bodies. They could. Right. They could. Could is that of the town clerk or the clerk of the select board or uh, it would depend on each town okay. on how they're set up. I, I think in many cases it is the town clerk that it, that has the agenda in front of them, but I don't know how your town is set up as far as that goes. Minutes. What are they? They give a true indication of the business of the meeting, covering all topics and motions at a minimum. And this is, this is, I want to be really clear about this. So at a minimum, you want to notice, you want to put in your minutes what members of the board were there, who any active participants were, any motions, proposals, or resolutions that were proposed, and what happened, what were the votes vote results and if and if there was a roll call for that vote you want to put that in there as well um, I think with three members it's hard to have a roll call <laughs> Jim, if, if, you know when uh, it says all business um, when you had your dog leash thing you had 500 people show up you didn't have to say John Smith said this and John actually that's a great question because what we did and what you can do by the law, if you look at what is actually in statute, this is all it says. But what you can do is say, 
We had uh, half of the half of the people in the room want to, wanted to speak um, spoke against it. Half people, other people spoke for it, uh, and then we went into what action we took. So we would we always had when we would have a public hearing like that, we would have a sign up sheet and we would attach that sign up sheet to the minutes to say, here's the people that attended and spoke at the meeting. Jim, the official document is those, are those minutes that are approved by that body. Um, if the meeting is recorded, can that come back to that body and say, well, you missed this and that? Minutes are not verbatim. Minutes are supposed to be a reflection of the indication of the meeting. And so, if there was a whole section that was missed of something that you took action off the agenda, off the agenda, um, then you could amend your agenda, uh, your minutes. My understanding would be if you had a bunch of people come in and said, you know, we got a real bad problem on our road, we need to get it fixed, we would listen to that perhaps. May not put it in the, in, the, in, the, in the meeting minutes for that meeting, but add it to the next agenda, to the next meeting. Yeah, I mean, I guess. I don't think there's anything in the statute that would require that. To, you could do that. Um, I can read you the statute. Okay, okay. it's pretty well, short. It's pretty so, short. The minutes shall include at least the following minimal information. So this is setting the lower bar here as to what's uh, required. Minutes. All members of the public body present, all other active participants in the meeting, all motions, proposals, and resolutions made, offered, and considered, and what disposition is made of same. And fourth, the result of any votes with a record of the individual vote of each member if a roll call is taken. And that's all it says on That's all that's required. You can do that on one page. Active participants. So, so the public? I would say anyone in the public who spoke. So then I should have included 500 people that talk about the beach block. Listing them as present. Just very quickly, if you, have you ever gone in and been to a meeting and then you go read the minutes and you go, oh, wait a second. So I, a lot well, of times- I have, but I have heard of that. Happening. Right, so <laughs> sometimes minutes are interpreted by the town clerk and you read what the town clerk wrote and what actually happened and it's like, and then it gets into the newspaper and you go, well, no, wait a second, that interpretation is so wrong. The, the thing, and I want to be really cautious here, yeah. Minutes are not verbatim. Right. Minute, minutes will not cover what every person that was there said. Um, and I, we get calls all the time where people will call us up and say, but they didn't write down what I said. That's okay. Yeah. As long as they had the tenor of the, of the discussion, uh, it, it's okay. They don't have to write down what every, each and every person said. <coughs> what they have to do is give you an indication of the business of the meeting. So people spoke for it, people spoke against it. Um, you know, you've attached a list of people who spoke or who were active participants. Uh, that's what we did when we had the 150 people show up for the leash law. We attached the list of people who signed in that night and said, these are the people that were in attendance. Uh, there was a strong, segment that voted well, that uh, was in favor of the law and there was a strong group that said they didn't like the law and that's what we said even though it took us three hours of testimony we had it down in like three sentences and, and Jim, just a little bit more about minutes these minutes are the only record you will have 20 years from now right the business of the meeting so you want them to be a true indication of what happened these are the things that are archival and retained forever of all the documents that you have as a, as a public body so it's really important that they are true and accurate and give a true reflection of the meeting but that again it doesn't mean verbatim that's and, impossible and the well, only yeah, verbatim and truth is you know like well who gets to choose what isn't the select board is the final arbiter they're the ones that approve the minutes and it, so the someone can come and raise an issue and say hey this was not what was said or you know you need to correct this but it's up to the select board to do that and if the select board chooses not to there's nobody that's going to say uh, of course you might have this though <laughs> no it doesn't Okay. No, but it's an addition. Right. What, what is the obligation of the board to provide additional information if asked about a specific point in the minutes? 
for example, it's almost always the, Ra the, uh, the Randolph Herald who calls and says, hey, what exactly happened here? Tell me a little more. And I always just invite that reporter to the next meeting. Am I obliged to give her more information than what goes into the minutes? No. Okay. The minutes are supposed to be a true indication mm -hmm. of, your, of your board meeting. Yes. Uh, usually there's a section for public comment. If a member of the public raises a topic that is not included on the agenda, where your leash law issue was the reason for the agenda, so you can group everybody's right. opinion under one. If a member of the public raises a topic that is not on the agenda, and that topic uh, pertains to public property, municipal property, traffic and safety on a public right-of-way in the town. Uh, I believe that that should be included in the minutes, or at least perhaps the select board answer should be, thank you very much, we'll note it, we'll put it on our next agenda. So public comment period. Um, we, we made a habit when people would raise a public comment in that period for items not on the agenda, we would hear what they wanted to say, but we wouldn't react to it. We would, as I think Bruce said, put it onto the next agenda perhaps, or a future agenda coming up, depending on timing. Should it be included in the minutes that <coughs> was raised if, it, if it's relevant uh, to a municipal issue? I mean, I would, but I, I don't, I, there's nothing, concrete about that in the lock. But we would we would say, you know, so and so raised this issue, we'll take it up at a future meeting. Yes, like for example, um, maybe this is an example. My husband and I would stop would, would go to um, select board meetings um, and just go to the pub for public forum to make a comment. And we would, at one point, we uh, wrote a letter to the select board that we submitted during those public comments. The contents of that letter were not in the minutes, but the fact that we spoke and what we spoke on was just in the public forum. Uh, and, and if, like, they, they were here to speak about, and they spoke about this to us. Well, and, and in that particular instance where you submitted a letter, that letter would be a public record. Yes. So someone would have that in the town offices. So. Uh, when do minutes have to be posted? No later than five calendar days after the meeting. And I want to be really clear, that part of the law hasn't changed in over 30 years. What did change about five years ago, I think it was. Probably more than that. Yeah, maybe seven years ago, was that they should be, they, they need to be made available for inspection and copying upon request within that five day period. But now they added, the legislature added, posted to a website if the public body maintains or designates. So uh, they felt, the, the, there was a lot of select boards out there who were not posting their minutes or the last set of minutes that were posted were, you know, January of 2018. And here we are in September of 2019. So what, what the legislature said is if you maintain a website, you need to post them within five days. So the five calendar days is the same as it's been for 30 years. Now, I'm gonna be the first one to tell you that not every town has followed that, but I would also be the first one to tell you that based on what the minutes are supposed to have, there's no reason why a select board can't put together a one pager and just say, there are three members of the select board who are here. Um, we had five people attend the meeting. There were no resolutions or uh, motions taken other than to adjourn and just have it. And then they can update the minutes at a later date. But the minutes are, and, and Chris said it, the minutes are the history of your board. Jim? <coughs> when you, when you uh, post those minutes for draft minutes, 
I don't think there's anything in the law that says draft minutes have to be approved by the body later on. They don't, but you have to have minutes. So right. if, if you leave draft, uh, first of all, if you have draft minutes, I would say make sure it's clear on there that they're draft. And then the law was, was I don't know if I would want to call it, what was it, Chris? It wasn't really amended. It was just, it was added to it that said that you can replace your draft minutes with your permanent minutes once they're approved. If you post draft minutes and you realize that there is an error in those draft minutes, can you take them down and repost other draft minutes? Yes. Okay. And the first draft minutes would go away? The first draft minutes would go away. Okay. Do you have to make note of that change? Mm, well, you probably are going to keep that in the file, but it's not, it's not like you would, the, the, the draft minutes essentially go away once you have permanent minutes. I can tell you that the documents that Chris and I, we draft and redraft and whatever, we have a file in our, in our computers, but. Quick question, Jim. Um, town hall meeting day, each article. Are there specific minutes to each one of the articles presented at the town hall meeting day? In other words, well, town meeting is a completely different animal from your regular meetings. Okay, that's my question. But yeah. Does uh, the town clerk take minutes at the? I don't know. In your town, would it, does the town clerk take the minutes that, at town meeting? Is that a responsibility of the town clerk, or is that just? <laughs> it's, it, it's a responsibility of the clerk of the board, whoever the clerk of the board is, and they may designate the town clerk to take those minutes. They also, they also might, like in South Burlington, when I was there, we had a specific person who would, a woman who was retired, that came in and um, would, would take the minutes, record it and take the minutes so that she could write them up. I, I thought there was a statute that said the town clerk, regardless of who's the clerk of the board, is required to take the annual minutes. I don't, I'm not positive about that. No? That may be, um, in a lot of towns, the town clerk does take the minutes, but I'm, I'm speaking about minutes of the regular meeting. I'm not talking about town hall or town meeting day. I'm talking about the regular minutes of- Yeah, no, I realize that, but it's just a, a big, bigger question for town hall meeting day, and I was just curious if the town clerk's responsible, you know, for taking minutes per, per article or per conversation as they go down the articles. In other words, article number one, does she or he make notes and take minutes of people? Well, I would assume that, that, would make, I would make assume that, it, that no. she would be okay. keeping minutes based on if she, whether it's, it's the town clerk or anybody else, that they would take minutes based on each article that comes up. Okay. So you would have some kind of a description of what happened for that article, okay. including the vote. Okay. Kathy, is that what you do? Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Hi. I just want to have a clarification. So your commission meets and then you post draft minutes. Is it the draft minutes have to be no later than five calendar days, or you have to have those draft minutes and then, all, then you have to get the finalized minutes? I guess I don't understand the difference between drafting them and then finalizing them. Okay. Why you have to have Let me make this real clear. Yeah. <laughs> There's no such thing in the, in the uh, uh, statutes about draft. Okay, so they can just be finalized minutes. They can be your okay. final minutes. Great. Great. Uh, but generally, final minutes are not final until they've been approved by the body. Okay. So up to that point, they would be draft. But and by the body, but let's say it was the planning commission and the planning commission. Okay. All right, so if when the planning commission time, approves them. Yeah. We've had some time ago, we've had somebody take minutes and then read the minutes back to us at the end of the meeting. We say, sounds great, let's post them as minutes. Yeah, and, and let me give you a really good example, because this happened to me when I was city council chair. Um, we had a city manager, and when we went into executive session to discuss his evaluation, we, we always would leave the, the town hall part of the meeting and go up to his office and close the door. Well, we were in executive session, we, we discussed his evaluation, and we discussed his benefits. Generally, what would happen is the city manager, if we were going to take an action, we would go back down to the town hall, to the public meeting. Usually there'd be nobody there, because we, we always did our executive session at the end of the meeting. 
Um, and we went downstairs and went back to the meeting room and came out of executive session. I had took a motion um, to, to approve his evaluation and certain benefits. And the town manager would take the agenda because at that point our clerk who would take the minutes had already left. He would take the agenda, turn it over, and write any actions that we took once we came out of executive session. About five years later, I had retired. Four of the, the other four, we had a whole new city council. Um, the city manager retired, and about two years after he retired, the new city manager and the new select the city council said they couldn't find anything in the minutes that approved his benefits that we gave him. Mm -hmm. So they started, it was, this was reported in the free press. So they tried to take those benefits away. So they had a public meeting. Four of the five of us that were on the council at the time showed up. We said, look, we don't know why they're not in the minutes, but we took that action and you know, you should honor that. Make a long story short, he went to court, but and he eventually got his benefits. The fact of the matter was, we screwed up because we didn't put, get the minutes right. But we also didn't approve our minutes necessarily. We would have draft minutes, and we might, if our meetings went really, we used to meet twice a month, and our meetings could go till twelve o'clock, one o'clock in the morning sometimes, and we'd be tired, and we'd just say, "We'll deal with the minutes next meeting." Nobody thought to go back and check, really, did we get everything? We, we read them quick, yep, they sound right, and off we go. Minutes are important. They're the history of your board. They're the permanent history of your board. Get them right. So make sure that someone's looking at them and getting them right. When you get a minute, the board meet in private, which is normally called executive session. So what is it? It's a closed portion of the meeting. There's no more public involved. When is it appropriate? Only if the business to be considered fits into one of 14 categories, and only if the public body moves to enter from an open meeting. So we hear this often where a town normally has their select board meeting at seven o'clock. And they post the meeting that they're gonna have their, they're gonna go into executive session at 6.30 and then their public meeting at seven. They have to go into the public meeting first before they can go into executive session. Keep that in mind. You have to be in an open meeting and then take a motion and indicate what reason why you're going into executive session. And it can only be for talk, not action, with the exception of one thing, real estate options. If, if you're going in to fire someone from the, from the city or the town's uh, uh, staff, you can't do it in executive session. You can discuss it, but then you have to come out of the meeting and actually take a public, have a public motion to do that. When a board goes into executive session after a select board meeting, they have to state to the people that are there the reason for the executive yeah, session. Yeah, we'll get into that a little more. And they can't sign anything or not in executive take any session. action. Okay. Unless it's a real estate yeah. option. Okay. That's the only reason. Okay. Um, you can go in, let's say, Let's say you're having a lawsuit against you. You can go into executive session to discuss with you. You can ask your attorney to come with you uh, and have discussions about strategy or what you want to do, but you can't actually take an action until you come out. So, and in that case, you wouldn't. Um, but it, you know, if, if you go in and the, and the, and the uh, let's see, if you go into executive session and the, and the uh, um, your attorney has a, an agreement to settle a case, you can't sign it in executive session. That has to be done with a, a motion to sign it, whether it's the motion to allow the 
select board chair to sign the, the agreement or whether all three members of the select board have to sign it. So that would have to take place like at a, a meeting, a select board meeting? Well, it would just, you go back in the open session. Open session. You come out of the executive session and then go into open session. You exit. Yeah. You exit the executive yeah, session. Everybody's gone home because the executive session is after. Well, that's why you, you should let people know. I mean, what we used to say to people when we were going through the executive session, the only action we might take is X. A sign an agreement. What if it's not an executive session if there's no one there? Do you, uh, do you, what do you mean? Okay, you guys go up, the select board, well, the select board goes up into executive session and you come down to bring it to the public. Well, everyone went home. What happens with the decision and announcement of what went on in the it's, it's still a public, it's still a public session. It's still, it's, it's still public. It goes into the next. No, it would be part of that meeting. <laughs> so executive session is not necessarily, like we used to say, the only action we'll take is this, or the understanding is we're going to go into executive session to discuss uh, some strategy, and then we're coming out, and we'll, we'll adjourn for the night. What happens if there's an objection to the decision of the executive session by the public? There is no decision made in, this, in the executive session. You, you can make a decision in the executive session. All you can do is, the only decision you can make in an executive session is to come out of the executive session. Right, okay. But then you have a motion when you come out of the executive session, and if the public doesn't agree with that motion, it's made tough luck. Well, yeah, I mean, that's, that's what I mean, it's tough luck. Yeah, it, it, if the public doesn't agree with it, they should have stayed. And the public then Oh, so, they were absent? Oh, well, that's a good So, so I, I mean, I don't know how it's done here. So the meeting's not over. But it is. The meeting is not over because they went into executive session. Right. The public has the right to stay there and wait. The public has the right to stay. And if uh -huh. and it might be, I mean, I don't know if you hold your executive session right here. This is different towns, too, Jim. Yeah. But the, yeah. This, the, uh, the public doesn't have a right to know what went on in that executive no. session either. No, they don't have a right to know. They don't know what it's about. But if you come out of the executive session to take an action, the public has a right to hear or understand right. what action. You voted three to two to take this action. Well, what happens in the executive session if, if, it's, if it's a done deal, does the public still have the opportunity to move? You, the public has no right to know anything that happened in the No, not in the, no, no, what, you know, what I'm saying No is, minutes, nothing. Okay, it's totally proud, I get it, it's a vacuum. So, just, you guys, you know, okay. co collaborate, and then you come to us, and it's 10.30 at night, and the, the, the subject matter that you were discussing made a decision and the room's empty. It goes into the minutes. But tough luck for the citizenry if they weren't there to object. Um, I, I, I don't like to use the word tough luck, but yeah. <laughs> no. the, 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 the meeting is a public meeting until they have adjourned that meeting. Executive session could be at the beginning, could be in the middle, could be at the end. But if they still, even if it's at the end, they have to come back into open session to adjourn the meeting. Wow. I wonder how many things get done without anyone. Well, it depends on, I mean, I don't know how, I, I, I have no idea, and I'm not going right. to say how, how they do their meetings here. I know we used to do ours at the end of the meeting, and then we would actually say, as we were going into executive session, we would have the motion to go into executive session to discuss X, Y, and Z. Right. And the understanding is that the only action we will take is to adjourn the meeting. Or we possibly could sign a contract when we come out. So we, we let the public know that before we go into executive session that we might take an action or we might not take an action. Wow. But there are 14 statutory categories. Yes. Those let me get to them. <laughs> so the permit, some of the permissible reasons for going into uh, the executive session are that there's a specific finding, for instance, on the uh, that premature public knowledge would clearly place the public body or a person at, involved at a substantial disadvantage. And that is specifically about contracts, labor relations agreements, if you have a union, arbitration or mediation, grievances, uh, potential or probable civil litigation or prosecution, 
of which the public body may be a party, and then confidential attorney plan. Communications, that's just part of it. There's another page here that has other ones. But with these, whoops. With these, it's whether premature public knowledge would clearly place the public body or a person involved at a disadvantage. For instance, labor relations agreements, if you have a, I don't think you guys have a labor union here, but uh, in South Carolina we had labor unions. We had police union, fire union, public works union. Um, so we'd be discussing the contract. So the contract and labor relations agreements, we could go into executive session to have those discussions, but we could not sign them in that, discuss in that meeting, executive session. We had to come out in an open meeting and do it in an open session. Uh, if you're being sued, I, I remember one time we went into executive session and we asked our attorney to come in with us, and it was a zoning issue. And this is, attorney sits in front of a five-member council, and he says, I've got good news and bad news. And I said, all right, what's the good news? He goes, the good news, we can fight this case two ways. I said, what's the bad news? He says, we're gonna lose both. <laughs> and I looked up and down the city council, and I just said, uh, unless I hear an objection, please go settle this <laughs> whatever way you can. The point is you go into executive session with your attorney to discuss uh, communications and perhaps strategies or how you're going to fight a, a, uh, a lawsuit, how you're going to deal with it. Um, that's permissible. The other permissible reasons are negotiating or securing real estate purchase options, which is again the only thing you can actually take an action in private. Uh, the appointment, employment, evaluation, discipline, or dismissal of a public officer or employee, student academic records, exempt public records uh, from a public record act. So if, there's a, if uh, there's a discussion to be had because someone has requested specific public records, you can go into executive session if there are specific exemptions that prevent disclosure. Uh, clear and imminent peril to public safety, uh, let's say there's a dam up the hill and you it's about to breach, but you don't want the public to know yet until you've got a strategy on how you're gonna deal with it. You could withhold that information until you have a strategy. And I, that's a poor example, but it's an example. I don't know if there's a dam up above. <laughs> uh, and then municipal, this is the newest one, is municipal or school uh, security or emergency response measures. After some of the mass shootings that were occurring, we were there was a lot of um, requests for by of schools and, and towns uh, for their um, emergency response plans and whatever. You don't want to give all that information out because you don't want the bad guys who might get a hold of it to know how to get in. So these are the these plus. These are the only reasons you can go into executive session. And if you can't go in, if you go into executive session, let's say to discuss a uh, labor relations agreement, and that's all you stated in your motion, you can't all of a sudden start talking about the evaluation of the town manager <coughs> because you didn't say so up front. You would have to come out, make another motion, and then go back in. So it's only what you specific, specify in your motion that you can discuss. And Jenny, you can bring anybody you want into that meeting. And you can, the select board can add anybody that they, they can say, I want the, ta the town clerk, right. our attorney, public works guy, whoever it is that they, <laughs> they need to come into that meeting, into that executive session, they can request anybody. Can it be a citizen? It could be a citizen if, if it's pertinent. Yeah, okay. If it's pertinent. But it's also confidential. So it's also a very confidential meeting. So, the latest thing that we've got is meetings by electronic means. So things have changed. It used to be that, you know, an electronic means was a telephone. But now it's, you can do Skype and all these other things. 
Uh, a member participating remotely must first identify him or herself when the meeting starts and be able to be to hear everything that's going on in the meeting and to be heard throughout the meeting. And if a quorum or more, so let's just say in your case there's two select board members are going to be out of town but one is still here, uh, they can still meet. The agenda must designate a physical location where the public can attend and participate and where one member or designate must be physically present. So you, it could be that you say the town clerk will be at City Hall to uh, man the computer or whatever um, for this meeting. We had, we had this happen to us uh, right after Act 68, which you might remember. Um, so Act 60, actually Act 60, not 68, Act 60, the school funding law back in 1998. There was a time period where after a certain date, it was July 1st, that any um, um, agreements between municipalities and businesses or whatever to state a tax stabilization agreements uh, that had to be in place by July 1st of 1998. Um, South Burlington managed to be, is the host of Burlington International Airport, but it's owned by the city of Burlington. And we had a tax stabilization agreement with them for every 10 years. Basically, they say, we think it's worth this, we say, it's, we think it's worth this. They file in court and we agree to a tax stabilization agreement. We were due to have one, but we were, four of the five of us, or three of the five of us, were gonna be out of state uh, on vacation or at meetings or whatever. We called in, but we had the meeting scheduled, so the, the, the town manager set up a um, speaker phone where the three of us called in on a conference call. The other two were there with the town manager. And we actually had a member or two of the public as well as a member of the press there to listen to the meeting. This was all before this was, this was available, but we were doing it back then. And the whole idea is that the public, again, has a right to know, a right to attend, and a right to participate. That's what you gotta keep in mind. Um, any vote not unanimous must be taken by roll call so you know how everybody voted. <coughs> so here's, again. Is that, is that true in every, in every instance or just electronic? Because if you have a two to one vote, you have to say it's these two voters are permitted to no. this one. No. no but only electronic. If you're doing electronic or if, I mean, if, if it's not clear who voted for what, and let's say you as elected were choosing, say, well, the vote passes two to one. Someone in the public might say, well, wait a minute, I didn't hear two votes, um, and ask to have a roll or whatever. But you can just put a roll call for three members is not bad. Right, but you could just put in the minutes uh, normally that it was a two to one vote. Motion carried. Yes. You don't have to say it was the one. Most people will know. Right. <laughs> So again, public participation, this is key to all open meeting laws. That's what it's about. You have a right to attend, to obtain a meeting agenda in advance, to be notified directly of upcoming special meetings, to have disability accommodations if necessary pursuant to Vermont safety discrimination statutes. You have a right to participate and a reasonable opportunity <coughs> to express opinions on matters being considered. Uh, and basically it's enforced the law. <laughs> so why comply? Meetings held without respect, respecting the details of the law may be considered illegal and the courts may regard any actions taken in those meetings as voidable. More importantly, illegal meetings do, does offend our notions of openness, accountability, and our democracy. And in Vermont, the people rule, sometimes directly, sometimes indirectly, through our elected or appointed representatives, but always with the benefit of public scrutiny. Um, again, following up on why comply, the following people can be 
charged with a misdemeanor and fine a member of the public body who knowingly, they, they really made this very clear now, a member of the public body who knowingly and intentionally violates the open meeting law, a person who knowingly and intentionally violates the open meeting law on behalf of a member of the public, and a person who knowingly and intentionally participates in the wrongful exclusion of a person from a meeting. So those people can be charged. The Attorney General or any aggrieved individual can bring a lawsuit in court asking for injunctive relief to stop a specific behavior, uh, for a declaratory judgment making a binding determination of what, what the rights were. And the law was changed uh, to include attorney's fees, which you have to win substantially in order to get your attorney's fees. So if, if a member of the public were to sue um, a, a select board and substantially wins uh, in the court decision, then they may, they could be awarded their but attorney's fees. But it doesn't fees. work the other way. But it doesn't work the other way. The burden's on government. Enforcement, written notice to the public body by being grieved an individual or attorney general alleging that there is a specific violation and is requesting a specific cure. The public body's public response within 10 calendar days, acknowledging that the violation did occur and stating the intent to cure it or stating that they don't consider it a violation. The public body's cure, if, it, if, it, if the public body acknowledges violation must be within 14 calendar days of the public response either ratifying or declaring as void the action taken uh, and adopting specific measures that actually prevent future violations. And the aggrieved individual's recourse if unsatisfied is to follow, file a lawsuit in Superior Court within one year after the meeting. That's it. <laughs> Any other questions? Uh, you didn't go over public records, but I did have uh, a couple of questions about public records. Um, say there's public records that are missing, that you go to the town and you ask for a certain public record and it's just not there. What is the recourse for the member of the public? Not much, okay. unless you can prove that they willfully destroyed them. Okay. okay. I mean, it's either available or it's not. Okay. Uh, what if they were once there and now they're not? Well, again, I, I can't answer because I don't know okay. what happened to them. What was the reason that they disappeared? Mm -hmm. um, if it, it could be that they just got mixed up. They might turn up in another file at a later date. It, mm -hmm. it could be that uh, it was an inadvertent. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And what is your uh, opinion of a town having a website? Personally, I think all towns should have a website. Okay. But there's expense and time in doing that. Jim, there have been instances where it kind of stayed on the website, yes. but not comply with it. Yeah, there have been, yeah, Montgomery is one town that did that. They, they actually, they threatened to do it uh, when the, the five day rule went in, but we sort of explained to them that the five day rule has always existed. It was just that now you had to po post it on your website. And you know, I get it back in 20 years ago when websites first started to happen, they were basic websites. Uh, you think back, I think, you know, to actually uploading documents and stuff to, to an email and sometimes it would take 15 minutes to upload a document and then send it and then it would take another 10 minutes. Uh, I get it. But today, the way our systems work, it's basically point click and off it goes. Well, now we have AC fiber. It might even be yeah. faster. So, yes, sir. Um, and, and say you're looking for, for, for records, I just, I was listening to TV the other night, there was a guy that wanted video from uh, Burlington there that won a case. I was, uh, I participated in that case. <laughs> Go ahead. I, I was on the winning side. So, <laughs> can, can uh, a town yeah. require you to pay for them to find records? And if they can't find records, uh, how long can they go not 
looking for them or saying they can't find them? I mean, is there a specific time period where they have to say we just don't have them? So uh, I'm looking over at Chris because th this, we get this all the time, but uh, essentially if someone requests records of a town, of the government, you are supposed to produce those records promptly. There's no thing about what is promptly. However, there is another provision in the statute that says that a government agency has three days to deny a request and they have to do it in writing. It didn't used to be, but now they have to do it in writing and they have to explain why in writing and what your what your appeal process is. Does the request have to be in No. Not necessarily. It's, it really is, if the town has taken, uh, I would say no, but there are cases where uh, uh, towns or uh, government agencies have said that any request has to be in writing, but they, it's a policy. As long as everybody's treated the same, but you know, I, I could write it on the back of a piece of cardboard and say, Kathy, I need I need these documents, um, or I could call you up and say it. Um, so it really depends on each town how how they set it up. I don't believe it. I think if you get a request that is lengthy or looks for a lot of documents or is something you're gonna have to go search for, I mean, really search for. They may not be here, they might be stored someplace else. I think then you have a right to say, one, can we try to reduce what it is that you're, what is it you're actually looking for? Because maybe I can find that quicker. But if someone gives you a very broad request and says, I want all of these records pertaining to this issue, and you can ask them to reduce it down to what they're really looking for. So you have that ability. That didn't used to be in the law, but it is now where you can negotiate basically over what it is that the person's looking for. But again, we will only ask someone, like we have a couple of what we call frequent flyers, and we will tell them that, because they'll give us a long list of stuff they want. And we'll say, look, we don't want to miss anything, so please put it in writing to us, and we'll, we'll be more than happy to meet your requirements. So if a town can't produce the records, to get back to my original question, can they charge you an hourly rate for somebody to work for? If they can't produce them. Or, well, I mean, what do you think, Chris? <laughs> so the law says that you can charge for time over 30 minutes. In, in complying with the request for records. Now, it's really unfortunate if a state agency or a town doesn't have their records management to work. Well, it sounds yeah. like and you're the individual that. is being charged for, so the town can get their records in order. Well, mean, why, should I have, why should somebody have to pay? I don't disagree with you there. <laughs> why should somebody have to, to pay for somebody to find records that should be so there or declared on final. Yeah. So, so going to the particular case you were talking about, so that was a videotape, a police videotape, and a, a citizen happened to witness what had occurred, and he wanted to view the tape to see if he got it right in his head. You know, he was not a party to it, but he wanted to view the, the tape. Police department in the city of Burlington said, um, "Well, we have to produce a copy." He asked to just look at it, to inspect it, and the, the law makes a distinction between inspection and actual copy. The town said, "We have to make a copy so that we can redact juveniles' faces and things like that out of it, um, and it's going to cost you seven hundred dollars to get to get to look at this tape." So he took it to court. The ACLU took the case for him. And then what happened was I also filed an amicus on behalf of the ACLU and this individual saying the law is clear that if you want to inspect records, you don't have to pay, you don't have to pay to see to inspect. You only have to pay if you want to stop. 
we, yeah, can we please keep it quiet for a minute? So the, the court ruled that we were right, that the, that, the, that the town can't charge for inspection of records, which is what we held for a long so time. So basically, if somebody asked to see some records, and the town goes, well, if you want to inspect records is one thing, but if you want a copy of a record, that's another. Correct. I mean... And this is the art. The argument is about records management and proper records management. And unfortunately, what happens is the citizenry ends up getting the short end of the stick because, and I don't mean the towns in general, the government in general, uh, but government doesn't do as good a job managing their records to keep them in order to make it easy. Uh, EB-5. Well, I mean, it sounds like justice goes to the highest bidder. You know, if you've got to pay to see public records. We hope it doesn't. That, our goal is to make sure that doesn't happen. Well, but yeah, let me give you an example. EB-5 up in JP, right. there was, uh, um, Vermont Digger was requesting all kinds of records on it. At one point, they were told, if you want to see copies of these records, it's going to, it's going to cost you $200,000. Uh, Vermont Digger doesn't have $200,000 just lying around. Um, and I sided with Vermont Digger and said, no, you asked to see the records. You didn't ask for copies of them. Um, and, and then um, I was, they were told, well, we have a lot of work that we have to do to pull those emails out. Well, it just so happens that I had four or five dozen emails about EB-5 that came to my email, and I had them in five minutes, put them on a, on a thumb drive and, and handed it to the press. I also got told that I shouldn't do that <laughs> and I, by the Attorney General's office, and, that, and I said, well, you're not my attorney on this one, so anyway. <laughs> Um, my question, whoops, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. You're first. <laughs> okay. My question is, what else does this apply to? Like we've talked about select boards and local government. Planning. Cemetery commissions, planning um, boards, zoning boards. What about municipal? Um, what about planning districts? Regional planning? Regional planning. Yeah. Um, Anything that's a state constituted or any of its subdivisions. So if it, if the state statutes, how do I put it? If the state statute enacts a board or a commission or a subcommittee, in the city of Burlington, they have a 14 member city council. They have finance committees of three. Yes. They have another committee of three. They didn't used to consider, they thought those were off limits, but. They've since learned that those have, they have to have minutes for those, they have to have quorums, they have to follow the open meeting law. So, so any committee, subcommittee, commission? Let me give you an example of something that's got people in my town going. Uh, we have a group that is a committee mm -hmm. of the regional planning district. Yep. That group has a, um, a something the voters will vote on, and they're campaigning for it. Um, they hired a kind of a, a PR guy, hired him for a dollar, and they set up a not advertised meeting that was a what do you call it? Uh, uh, it was a focus invitation only focus group meeting. Okay. And members of that committee went to it, but they made sure they didn't have a quorum of that group go to it. So they said it didn't have to be an open meeting. So it doesn't matter if it's a quorum of the regional planning group, it's what is the constitution of that commission or whatever it was called. So if they have a committee that's set up, that they have, that was set up with 12 members, or let, let me say 11 members, mm -hmm. then six would be a quorum. And it doesn't mean a quorum of the board, it's right. a quorum of the committee. Of the committee, yes, and that's what they did. They made sure there was not a quorum of the committee. 
then they can't, if they don't have a quorum of the committee, they can't take any actions. Right. They could have discussions, but they can't take any action. Okay, I see. Oh, so, oh, I'm sorry, you had your hand up first. Yeah, I, uh, Austin Chris can help with this. And, okay, the safekeeping of town minutes. Real or received, missing. Nine months go by, the hands are being thrown up by the select board. Just, just don't know, just can't find them. At what point is it the liability of the select board to give a call to the county sheriff? <laughs> We just want to make it legit that we're done looking, but you know, we just don't get it. I didn't see the county sheriff in that list. <laughs> I, I was asking Chris. <laughs> <laughs> so, so is your question, what's the, what's the remedy? What's the accountability of the... Well, who's the safekeepers? Who, who's liable? They're the record, the town is the custodian, is the official custodian, it's their responsibility. Uh, we have a state archives and records administration division. We have a state archivist who works with all the towns on record schedules and how to handle and preserve all what those records. What key needs to be kept for how long or well, permanent? You know, there will be times when records are missing. It's unfortunate, but it happens. Well, it's unfortunate, but what does the public expectations of having it finalized that they're just Missing. Well, How do you think first of all, I would certainly hope that the minutes don't show up missing. Um, and I would think that minutes, even if the actual minutes showed up as missing, there must be a record someplace. Um, but, you know, it's... Well, I would have thrown into a town hall and stole a piece of art. If someone went into the town hall and stole a piece of historic artwork, and the town, the two people can't find the artwork, I would think they'd call the police because it's a... It's well, yeah, in that case, yeah. Yeah, but well, what's the difference between uh, records that are missing and... Well, there is, a, there is a remedy. You can go to court for the town records. Yeah, it's just... But, but the, the... I don't know that... I've never heard of a town not having their records. I th I've heard them that they're misplaced or whatever, but I, I think that, you know, a town that would willfully destroy their minutes, boy, I, I've never heard of that. And, and that would be something that's charging. Yeah, that would certainly be something that's charging. I mean, say a particular town has a commissions could be any commission, planning, uh, conservation. In that particular, and they're all appointed by the select board, the members of the mm -hmm. commission. And the commissions aren't abiding by open meeting law, by the mice, like posting correctly. Who would you go to complain to? Would you go to the select board to make your, you would? And second, well, first I would go to the planning commission. Let's say it's a planning commission. I would go to the planning commission and say, you're not following the open meeting law. And then it's up to them to say yes or no. And if you didn't like what they said to you, you could then go to the, to the uh, select board and complain to the select board that, that the planning commission isn't following the open meeting law. Um, but really, the, town's is, the town select board is independently elected. Um, are you appointed or elected? The, the, the town clerk is, is elected independently of anybody else. So um, I'm independently elected. The governor can't tell me what to do. Um, and I remind him that I got more votes than he did. <laughs> You, yeah, the, I mean, the select board is responsible for appointing the members of the commissions and, and uh, boards in, the, in its town, whether it's a cemetery commission. What recourse is there? They come and complain to the select board, and I say, hey, listen, I'm talking to them, they know the open meeting law, I, I, you know, they're not posting, I understand that, what can you do? You it's fire, called, it's, it's you called people? town meeting, maybe. Right. I, I mean, really, it, it comes down to the actual 
actions of the people, the votes of the people are who controls the select board. Um, and I don't know if your planning commission, some towns, their planning commission or zoning board are also elected, but uh, most cases they're, they're appointed by the select board. Um, so the select board has responsibility over those boards and commissions. And if they're not following the law, the select board needs to step up. And if they don't step up, you can go to town meeting and or file a complaint. Well, you can file a complaint if, it, if they're violating the law. Right. And uh, second, uh, would that be a topic raised? Would that be a constitute as being a topic? As a topic. And an active participant. You mm -hmm. mean at the meeting? Yeah. On the agenda? Yeah. Um, you could raise it in, under the public comment period. You could ask that the select board add it to their agenda for a future meeting to take action on it. Um, but it's. Um, should go on the minutes that a member of the public is complaining that open meeting law is not. I would hope so. I would hope so. Okay. That's correct. I do have a, a quick week. Um, subcommittees, are they responsible? I, there was some conversation about subcommittees, like say there's a budget committee or a, the, yes. you know, we're going to put, they have to do them. minutes and all that. Okay. And um, vault research. I go in, I want to go in the vault and look at stuff. Do I get charged by the hour to go in and just uh, look? That uh, depends on each town and what the town clerk's fees are set up. Okay. And nonprofits. <laughs> I mean, most realtors and mm -hmm. lawyers pay a, a vault fee. Okay. Nonprofits. You mentioned that they don't have to follow uh, meeting minutes and all that, but I know you have a database on your web page for all businesses and then domestic nonprofits come up. You mentioned them having charters or bylaws. Would they be filed with no. the state? Okay. Where would they be filed or would they be filed? Anyway? You would have to ask them for it. Okay. Thank you. So, um, you know, we are, we are working with the legislature on creating a boards and commissions website, but that's kind of a different animal. It's, um, right now it's not in, in existence technically, and, uh, but uh, and what you're asking about, are, we don't keep the bylaws for the nonprofits. Mm -hmm. So, if you ask to see select board meeting minutes, just to see them, you can't be charged? Uh, that's what we, we think. And there's a the Supreme Court that, Supreme Court decision that agrees with that. Is that Ken? Yeah. Right. Is that? The, could you repeat your question? If you ask to see select board meeting minutes, can you be charged for the time it takes to find those? If you want a copy of them, yes. Or okay, if you just want, just to, want to look at a book or something, no. you can. You can do it, say no. No, no. Okay. That's all I need. There should be no charge for inspecting records. So you can hang out in the vault all day. Just keep reading. Yep. The vault, town clerk's vaults are something special. Hang on a second. I think I had something else. I'm also an auditor and chair. Good for you. And when <laughs> we audit, we Warn our initial meeting, which I've just done this week, and when we hold our meetings, we decide when the next one is going to be at the at that meeting. So we have a running warning, so to speak. We also take notes on what we've done that evening. We take, if I take notes, if I also take down who was there who was present and what we say we did doing with taxes tonight. And, you know, that's what we did. We worked on doing with taxes. Is that running journal okay for minutes? Does that have to be well, posted? Well, I think our auditors in a different category. It's a different. Um, it, I think there are some exemptions for site visits, but okay. I, I don't want to say that off the top of my head. No. Yeah, we'd have to it's look at it. It's kind of like a running journal. It's yeah, I mean, I, the, 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 the fact of the matter is you need, you should have some kind of minutes of, of your meetings. So um, it's a good idea. Yeah. That, that's, if someone challenges so you, we they want to know. So we have a journal and somebody says, well, what did you do on October 19th? We did 
doing the taxes and <coughs> studying. Yeah. So as long as you keep the record. Um, when you ask to see these records, um, but we're back to these. We're back to these. <laughs> yeah, I gotta get this straight. Uh, do they just like open the vault up and say, well, it's in there? Or say you want to see, like, well, let's say, select board meeting minutes. Well, Should I would be able to say, well, let's see, if you're looking for, say, year 1930, 1935, it should be in that volume right there. So I would say that it will depend on each town clerk, and, and I'm going to I'm going to uh, relinquish that question to the town clerk here and say I don't know how she would do it. So there's nothing in statute that says you got to follow this procedure. But I would say that she's not going to just let you go willy nilly into the vault and right. make a mess of the thing. Well, that's what I want. She's going to say just a second and go get the minutes that you're looking for. Okay. Is that true? Yeah. And no chair. No chair. <laughs> it's all an ops. Let me let me be clear. I listened to what the town clerk said. But the measure, <laughs> the measure is generous and greatly exaggerated. <laughs> yes, sir. 